Good evening and welcome to Upheaval. I'm Alex Rodriguez, an associate speaker with the Voice of Prophecy, and we are delighted that you have joined us tonight. Now, the Voice of Prophecy began broadcasting in 1929, and since then we have opened up something like 2,200 Bible schools all over North America, and we have affiliate Bible schools all over the world. In fact, we have Bible schools in some of the hardest to reach places in the world, places that we can't even mention where they're at because it's illegal to study the Bible there. In 1942, we launched the Bible School of the Air. We have had literally millions of people worldwide study the Bible through the Voice of Prophecy Bible Studies, and we are so excited about that. Tonight is a very special night because tonight we are launching a brand new set of Bible studies. Let me show you what those look like. This is our focus on Daniel studies, and they are, I think, just absolutely beautiful. And we are launching that tonight with this very, uh, this very program. And we, we were thinking to ourselves, what, what, what's the best way to launch a program like this or launch Bible studies? And we thought, what about if we just introduced the book of Daniel? And that's really what upheaval is all about. It's an introduction of the book of Daniel. Now, Bible schools and Bible studies are, are just a fraction of what we do at the Voice of Prophecy. We make tons of programming and resources, and, and we have events just like this, and we make that available to the world church. Over the last two years, we have been working on a very special program on mental health. And I think it is going to be one of the best things we've ever done. In fact, I'm so excited about it, and I think you're going to be excited about this as well. This is going to air nationally from April 4 through 6 of 2024. Let me show you what the trailer looks like on this. My issues just made people uncomfortable. The way that they handled that was just to avoid me. Do you have any good scars? And she said, Andrew, I do. Some of them I can show you and some I cannot. The word asylum actually means a place of refuge or sanctuary. Lobotomies or electroshock. They did insulin therapy, ice water therapy. There's the logical part of your brain, which is the frontal lobe. And then there's the emotional part of your brain, which is the limbic system. They lack hope. They feel like others are against them. Their illness is against them. Depression is the leading cause of disability worldwide. Your amygdala goes, I have to survive. I want comfort. It feels like you have this lead jacket on. You can barely walk. Swimming is actually very therapeutic. You can cry and no one knows. On this side, you have reckless, careless. You get to the other side where we find panic, fear, you freeze. I sit on the edge of my bed for 30 minutes just contemplating what to put on. Who cares? They're closed. One of the amazing things about the human brain is that it is highly plastic. It's very changeable. If you had diabetes, would you take insulin? If you needed glasses, would you wear glasses? Like, you have a chemical imbalance. Your limbic system is in overdrive. Stigma is not biological. Cultural laws are sometimes arbitrary, but they're still binding. Stigma is, is the umbrella. Embarrassment, um, pride, uh, macho. Well, is everybody good? And everybody's not good. What we're really talking about is who we are, who we were meant to be. It's just a biological issue. Well, it is, but it's more than that. It's a social issue, it's a relational issue, it's a spiritual issue. L let's just start with the reality. They're not separable. Mark your calendars, that is April 4 through 6 next year, 2024. If you want more information, you can go to mindfitevent.com. It's mindfitevent.com. But tonight, Upheaval with Sean Boonstra. I have a dream. Following national goals. The war in Vietnam. I believe that one of the reasons Concerns about the deadly coronavirus officially. The U.S. economy is slowing down. There are people who have violently entered the United States Capitol. 
the country at all, land, sea, and airport. Multiple victims down, school shooting. Welcome to Upheaval, a very special one-night online gathering for those of you who are watching on the internet, and uh, a personal gathering here in Loveland, Colorado, in the Loveland Seventh-day Adventist Church. Very pleased that they've agreed to host us this evening. A big thank you to Pastor Joe Martin for having us. A very special evening, and I'm really appreciative for it. I'm appreciative for everybody who's come. And honestly, we had no idea when we named this special evening all those months ago just how appropriate the name Upheaval was going to be. You've likely seen all of the absolutely horrific footage that is coming out of the Middle East, and it seems like we're living in a moment of huge upheaval yet again. So here's what we're going to attempt to accomplish tonight. We're going to try and look at the entire flow of recorded history, everything, thousands of years worth, and see if we can give context to the last, say, three or four years and figure out what's going on. And if I'm really honest about it, that is far too ambitious of an undertaking for one evening. I mean, how in the world can we cover all of recorded world history in about an hour and five minutes? There's no way that we can actually do that. But what we can do is provide you with an important foundation and then set you free with that new course from the Voice of Prophecy, Focus on Daniel. I know that Alex just showed this to everybody. This is hot off the presses, and I'm pretty excited about it. This is going to give you an opportunity to go a lot deeper into what we're going to touch on this evening. And I think, because I've seen what's in here and I had a hand in editing it, I think that what you're going to find in these lessons, they're free, it's going to blow your mind. In fact, the content that's in here absolutely changed my life. It's the reason that I don't just believe that God exists, I know that God exists. Now, tonight is for absolutely everybody. It doesn't matter what your background is, wherever you're joining us. You, you might have a Christian background. You might not. You might be an atheist or a Buddhist or a Taoist. It, it doesn't really matter. I want everybody to feel welcome. You're going to get something out of this. But in full disclosure, I'm a practicing Christian. And so every time that I talk about the Bible, I believe that this is not an ordinary book, that it actually is God's Word. And so I always start with a word of prayer. So whatever your background is, I'm hoping you'll indulge me for a moment as I just ask God's blessing. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, this evening, as we turn to the pages of the Bible, we know this is not like every other book on the bookshelf. I know that in this book, my life was changed because I heard you speak to my heart. Everything changed when I met you here. And I'm asking that you'd bless my words tonight in a way that they become honoring to you. The thing I really want, Father, is to know that when I'm done tonight, you are smiling because I've been found faithful. And we covenant with you tonight that when you speak to our hearts, we will follow the Lamb wherever He goes. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Back in 1969, I made my very first appearance on planet Earth in the middle of the night on a Tuesday morning in a tiny village in northern British Columbia. We had 4,500 people, and we often bragged that we had 5,000. We were lying to make the village seem just a little bit bigger. And in 1969, when I came into the world and the doctor picked me up by my little legs and spanked my little backside, and I took my first breath, the rest of the world was not having as good a day as me. They were recovering from a great deal of chaos. Not, not that 1969 was a horrible year, I happen to think. It's one of the greatest years in modern history for obvious reasons, and a lot of good things happened that year. 1969, that's the year Neil Armstrong became the first person to set foot on the lunar surface, and as you can imagine, every kid in my generation, what did we want to be when we grew up? Astronauts. We all wanted to be astronauts, and I started to collect everything that had to do with the space program somewhere. I, I tried to find it in the garage so I could bring it tonight. I couldn't find 
find it, but I have a little gold medallion they gave all the staff when Apollo 11 touched down on the moon. They gave this medallion out at Cape Canaveral. I wanted to show it to you, but I still have it somewhere. We all, all want to be astronauts. 69 is a really, really good year, more than that. That was the year they rolled out the first Concorde jet and it made its first test flight. If you happen to be under the age of 30 and don't know what the Concorde is, it was a supersonic jet that could cross the Atlantic in less than half the time of a normal flight. I think you could get from New York to London in just under three hours. The problem with it was it was prohibitively expensive and nobody could afford to fly it, and so they collapsed the program and it's gone. But they did roll it out in honor of my birth in 1969. It was also the year that the Beach Boys came out with that album, Surfing USA. And I don't care how cranky you are. I'm a cranky guy. I'm getting crankier by the year. You start playing Surfing USA in the background and my bad mood is gone. And some of you are already hearing that song play in the back of your minds. That's 1969. It is a banner year. It's also the year when we started bringing American troops back from Vietnam. So people's mood started to elevate. And of course, 1969 was also the year when Woodstock happened. Now, that's not my cup of tea. You wouldn't have found me at Woodstock. Not really my thing, but a lot of people look back at that and say, oh, that was a signal moment in American history, 1969. It's also the first time, 1969, in the history of the world that a message was sent over the internet. It just wasn't called the internet in 1969. They called it ARPANET. And eventually it became the internet and it exploded so quickly that today we have a whole generation that doesn't remember a world that wasn't connected to the internet. And the internet came out when I was one day old. So I like to tell myself they invented it to tell the world that I had arrived. Just broadcast that news all over the planet. 1969 for me, great year. It was a great year, but for a lot of people it wasn't because they were still nervous. They were still reeling from what had happened before 1969. Really, what happened in 1967. We had the Six-Day War, the last time, other than the Yom Kippur War in 73, the last time we had this level of violence in the Middle East. And then 1968 proved to be something of a hot mess. That's the year we got the Tet Offensive in Vietnam, and the North humiliated the troops in the South, and it generated an awful lot of stress here in America because this was the first war that was ever broadcast on TV. Up to this point, you had to go down to the movie theater and watch the newsreels in World War II to see what was going on. In Vietnam, they broadcast it into our homes, and of course, that raised stress levels significantly because we could see the reality of war all over the country for the first time. It was also the year 1968 that North Korea managed to capture the USS Pueblo and take the crew hostage. And that was a humiliating blow to our Western confidence. 68, it's the year that Martin Luther King Jr. was murdered at the Lorraine Motel in Memphis. It's the year that Robert Kennedy was assassinated by Saran Saran. And for a lot of people that year felt like the world was starting to fall apart. In 1968, college students in New York City started to protest the war. That led to protests all over the planet, which in turn led to another protest in the streets of Chicago during the Democratic National Convention. And that riot led to Richard Daley, the mayor of Chicago, sending the police out in the streets to squash the protest. And that filled our TV with images of unbridled violence yet again. In 1968, a lot of people were convinced that civilization was actually hanging by a thread. We had no idea what was coming next. It was easily, 68 was easily one of the most troubled years in modern American history. And the stress of 1968 went on for another 11 or 12 years. The Yom Kippur War, 1973. The inflation of the late 1970s. The energy crisis with people lined up at gas stations having to take turns every other day filling up their car. Really high interest rates by 1978. The collapse of the market by 1981, which meant that a lot of people were just out in the streets and they lost their home. 1968 was the beginning of a huge unsettled time Kind of like the last three or four years. 
Then after that, as we got down to the end of the 1970s and we got into the 1980s, we got optimistic. We got into this period of unbridled prosperity. We were very happy. That's the decade when I went away to college, and I can tell you we were all full of optimism in the 80s. It was a good time. The Berlin Wall came down by the end of that decade. We figured the Soviet Union was gone. The Cold War was finished, and now we don't have to teach kids how to hide under their desks anymore. And I've never understood, folks, how a desk was supposed to protect me from a thermonuclear device, but there we were. We were hiding under our desks. In the 80s, I went away to college. In the 80s, I met the girl that I was going to marry. In the 80s, I started on the career that I have today. It was a world full of optimism. And not just for me, for everybody. Even Tiananmen, Tiananmen Square by the end of that decade, that was in the past. And we thought, you know what? China's about to change. And everything went well through the 80s into the 90s. And it was all pretty good until that morning I was in my little townhouse in Toronto, Canada. I remember it well. I was shaving and I was shaving this, back when I shaved, I was shaving this side of my neck. And when I'm doing stuff in the morning, ironing a shirt, brushing my teeth, I always have the news going so I can hear it in the distance. And as I'm shaving this part of my neck, suddenly I hear a newscaster say, we think a small private plane has just flown into the World Trade Center. And I thought, that's odd. They don't allow small private craft in Manhattan. That shouldn't happen. So still shaving. I remember exactly I was shaving this spot. I walked around the corner and looked at the TV. And the moment I arrived, that's the moment I saw the second plane hit the tower in real time. You all remember when that happened too. I bet you remember exactly what you were doing and what part of your neck you were shaving that morning or if you shave, or whatever it was you were doing, you remember it in detail because it occurred to us finally, on that day, we haven't fixed anything on planet Earth. The world is still full of chaos. That day popped all of our optimism. And the only thing that should be surprising on 9-11 is the fact that we were surprised that something awful happened. Because if you think about it, when in the history of the human race have we ever had one moment of peace on this planet? When? In thousands of years of recorded history, we've only had one brief episode. It happened after the Battle of Actium, when Octavian, or Augustus Caesar, mentioned in your Bible, he took control of the Roman Empire, and that led to something we now call Pax Romana, the peace of Rome. And Rome, the city, was at peace for about 200 years. Out on the fringes of the empire, they had lots of skirmishes, lots of violence, but the city itself was peaceful, so they said they had world peace. What does it tell you that in thousands of years of recorded history, we have one moment of peace that we can point to, and it wasn't even very good? What does it tell you that we can't think of any moment when the world has not been in chaos? Why is it that the peace we hope for and pray for never seems to last? Every time we get our hopes up that maybe, just maybe this time, the human race is finally going to get it right, we'll get things together, why is it every single time it falls apart again and again and again and again, just like it fell apart again this last week? Why every time? And why are we surprised every time that it happens? Did you know that back toward the end of the 1800s, the end of the 19th century, and really up to about 1910 or 1911, there were prominent leaders all over the Western world standing up in public places declaring that the human race had evolved morally and that war was now going to be a thing of the past. It was never, ever going to happen again. I mean, look at all the scientific discoveries from the 1700s and the 1800s, and they were daring to believe that human ingenuity could fix our worst problems. You can go back to the Hansards of legislate. That's the written record of what's said in a parliament. You can go to the parliaments and the written records all over the world. And from about 1895 to about 1912, there were notable politicians standing up in parliament making big speeches. War is a thing of the past. It's never going to happen again. We're about to enter the universal golden age of peace. And by the close of the 20th century, 203 million people had been slaughtered in warfare. It proved to be the bloodiest century in the history of the world. And you've got to ask yourself, 
Why? Why was that so dark? When we walked into Auschwitz in 1945, it rattled us to the core, and it was the day that postmodern philosophy went mainstream among people, saying, we don't know what to believe anymore, and there's nothing you can count on. Why? Why is there so much darkness in the human heart? And why is it that we can't seem to fix what's wrong with this place? Why is it that our human nature can be so completely wonderful on the one hand, and we're generous and kind and loving, but one little thing happens and it's like a, a switch flips and we're violent and cruel and selfish? Why is it that every new generation gets their hopes up? We go out into the world, 21, 22 years of age, a shiny new college degree, and we think, that's it, our generation's going to change everything. But that generation just gets old and is disappointed and disillusioned like every generation that's come before it. Why can't we fix anything? All those social revolutions of the 1960s, 1968 in particular, they didn't change a thing. Nothing happened. And for some strange reason, the last few years are starting to feel like it's 1968 again. We've just come out of a global pandemic that destroyed an awful lot of Western prosperity, kept people locked in their houses for nearly two years. We had another embarrassing ending to another horrible war. We've seen violent unrest in the streets that reminds us of the riots in 1968. We've had so much political turmoil recently that people on social media are starting to wonder out loud if we're not on our way to another American civil war, because how do you fix this level of polarization? We've got war again in Europe. Everybody said after World War II, that's not coming back. The Cold War, when that ended in 89, that's it. Europe is safe. It came back, and it just came back. And we seem to be on the brink of yet another brutal recession, and the price of food is going up faster than your income, and the price of heating fuel going up faster than your income, and the racial tension in America seems to be getting worse instead of better, and it feels like you can't trust institutions anymore, and national debt, it just keeps rising, and governments are printing money like there's no tomorrow, and things like owning a home if you're young or retiring if you're old, they're starting to feel like they're going to be out of reach for everybody. And I know some people think, I felt pretty good when I came to this program tonight, and that's really a lot of depressing news, man. That's like a lot. No, hang in there with me. There is hope coming. You do have to wonder, though, how much more stress can everybody take? What is going to happen next? How much worse could it possibly get? The answer to that question, oddly enough, is found in the middle of the 1800s, in the 19th century, and the answer lies with this guy. His name is Hormuzd Rassam, and he is responsible for one of the greatest archaeological finds in the history of the world, in the history of archaeology. Archaeology itself is a science that is only a few hundred years old, and I know that a lot of people think this is the most important archaeological discovery of all time, the Rosetta Stone. That's not the real Rosetta Stone. The real one is about three feet high. It's in the British Museum, and if this was the real one, I'd probably be in prison tonight for having taken it. And everybody said, that's important because we could finally read the Egyptian hieroglyphics. So I know that my opinion is an outlier. I don't think that's the most important discovery ever made. I think what Hormuzd Rassam found is more important. He was born in Mosul. You probably recognize that city. It's near where the ancient city of Nineveh is. And you'll remember it because it was a hot spot for ISIS just a few years ago and another place of huge upheaval. On the day that Mr. Rassam was born, Mosul was actually still part of the Ottoman Empire. That made it all the way into the 1800s. And by some twist of fate, he became the paymaster for a British archaeologist by the name of Austin Henry Laird, who was famous for excavating the ruins of the city of Nineveh. You know, the city that's in the book of Jonah. So these two guys, Mr. Rassam and Mr. Laird, they work really closely together, and they became buddies, really close friends. Such good friends that Austin Laird sent Hormuzd Rassam off to England to go to school, and he got to go to Oxford, to Magdalen College. And when he came back from Oxford, he became the very first Ottoman archaeologist. Now, at that point, when he comes back home, for some reason, Austin Laird decides, I'm going to go back to Britain and run for office. I don't understand that. If you have a choice between running for office or digging around in an ancient civilization, I mean, which one are you going to choose? You, know, you run for office, they'll rip you to shreds. You dig in the ruins and you find interesting stuff. 
But Mr. Laird apparently doesn't think like me. So he went back home to practice politics and he left Mr. Rassam all by himself. And it turns out he went home just a little bit too soon. Because after he left, Hormuz Rassam made one of the most important discoveries of all time. It doesn't look like much. Again, this isn't the real one. It's a reproduction or I'd be in prison. You're not allowed to touch the real one. It's in the British Museum. It doesn't look like much. It looks like a broken clay tablet with a bunch of meaningless scratches on it. But when they deciphered what this says, they found this unbelievable story that comes straight from the library of an Assyrian king by the name of Ashurbanipal. And wouldn't you know it, the story on this tablet and the others they found happens in about the same period of history as Genesis chapters 4 through 11. It covers the same ground. Now, to be honest, we knew that the story on these tablets was out there somewhere because the Romans and others would uh, allude to it. They would refer to it in their writings, so we kind of knew it was out there, but we'd never read it, and we didn't know the details. And the details are really exciting. I mean, really exciting. In fact, they're so exciting, they say the scholar who managed to crack the code and translate this, his name is George Smith. He got so excited when he saw what this said that he jumped out of his chair in a library at the university. He started running around the room like his hair was on fire and stripping off his clothes. He went all the way down to his boxer shorts, yelling and screaming, I found something really important. And they found him in his underwear with the tablet. Wouldn't you believe what this says? What could be that exciting? It turns out this is the story of an ancient Mesopotamian king, a demigod, according to the Babylonians. His name is Gilgamesh. And the story goes like this. I'll give you the Reader's Digest condensed version. And look at me, pretend that I can actually read this tablet. Once upon a time, the Babylonians didn't start stories like that. Once upon a time, a very long time ago, the tablets say, there was a powerful name by the king of Gilgamesh, and he ruled the city of Uruk. Now, that's where we get the name for the modern country of Iraq. It was one of the cities that was in the Mesopotamian plain. And we know it was one of the earliest centers of human civilization. In fact, most scholars think that writing was invented in the city of Uruk. And what a coincidence that we find a whole bunch of ancient writing that stems back to this same city. The tablets tell us that Gilgamesh was part man. His father was completely human, a normal mortal. But then they say that his mother was a goddess. And to make sure that he was mostly God, they said he's two-thirds God and one-third human. And here's how the tablets describe this man. Gilgamesh, perfect king. Judge of the Anunnaki. I got to pause there because if you listen to late night radio like I do and hear George Norrie at two o'clock in the morning, they're going to tell you that the Anunnaki are space aliens that came and planted life here on earth. And that's just historical nonsense. That's just a name for the ancient Babylonian, Sumerian, Mesopotamian gods. Gilgamesh, the tablets say, perfect king, judge of the Anunnaki, wise prince, brace of mankind who surveys the regions of the world, ruler of the earth, lord of the underworld, thou art the judge, like a god, thou perceivest everything. You get the sense they think Gilgamesh is really important and really powerful. Thou standest in the underworld and givest the final decision. I, I find it remarkable. When we were translating stuff in the 1800s, we translated it into Shakespearean English, all of it, and nobody had spoken that for 300 years, but they wanted it to be really important sounding. And I can promise you that Gilgamesh did not speak Elizabethan and Shakespearean English. Thou standest in the underworld and givest the final decision. Thy judgment is not changed. Thy word is not forgotten. Thou dost inquire, examine, judge, receive, and lead aright. It's almost biblical language. It's the kind of language we usually think of when we're reading about God. Shamas, that's the ancient Mesopotamian sun god. Shamas entrusted into your hand judgment and decision. Kings, rulers, and princes lie prostrate before thee. This is a very important, very powerful man who thinks he's a god. Then the tablet goes on to tell us that Gilgamesh was arrogant, 
undisciplined and selfish to the point where he took the young men of his own city and forced them to build a massive wall around the city. He enslaved his own people. And to make things worse, while the young men were out building the walls, Gilgamesh took all their wives for himself like an ancient cult leader might. And, and in fact, he would actually reserve the right. I want to put this delicately. It's a family evening. But if you got married, he reserved the right to, let's say, visit your wife first. And as you can imagine, the people of Uruk started to really hate their king. He was an awful person. Easily one of the most awful people who has ever lived. He was the Hitler of the ancient world, the Stalin of the ancient world, the Pol Pot of the ancient world. He's awful. And eventually it says that life in the city of Uruk became so, so awful that the people cried out to their gods, please bring us some relief. If somebody doesn't do something about this king, he's going to kill us all. And the tablets tell us that the gods looked down and said, you know what, they're right, let's do something. So they created a monster. He's named Enkidu. And they thought, we'll put him on earth and Gilgamesh can keep himself busy fighting the monster. And if he's busy fighting the monster, he can't bother his people anymore. So Enkidu appears in the story and he's a wild man. He's one part human and two parts animal. He's kind of the mirror image of Gilgamesh, and he lives way out in the wilderness because he's mostly animal, and he's very happy out there. And the story goes that one day a trapper, a hunter, is walking through the woods, and as he's going through the trees, he suddenly spies this massive, hairy monster. It's like a Bigfoot sighting, and it scares him half to death. So he runs home to his father, Dad! Dad, I saw Bigfoot. Well, of course you saw Bigfoot, son. You've been nip nipping at the wineskins yet again. Haven't I told you you can't drink and hunt at the sun? No, Dad, really, it's really him. I saw something out there. We got to do something or he's going to come and destroy our house and probably eat us. We got to do something. And Dad says, you know what we're going to do? You go down to the city of Uruk and tell Gilgamesh about this monster. He'll know exactly what to do. So he does. He goes to Uruk and he tells the king. And the king has a plan. He does not assemble an army. He doesn't go out to fight this monster himself. Instead, he decides he's going to lure the monster to the city by using the services of a beautiful priestess of Ishtar whose name is Shamhat. She's beautiful. In fact, she's the temple prostitute. And he said, you know what, we're going to send her out in the woods and she'll lure him back to the city and we'll kill him then. And so she goes out and in Kidu the monster sees her and he falls in love. I mean, it's the first woman he's ever seen. It's like, wow, that is really pretty. That is better company than all these animals out in the woods. I'm going to follow her back to the city of Uruk. And so he does. She takes him back to the city. She civilizes him, as most women civilize most men. That's the way that it works. And he confronted Gilgamesh when he gets there. And Kido's mad because he's heard what a jerk this king is. And so he fights him in the streets. And the fight, according to the tablets, is so violent it rattles the walls of the city. And at the end, Gilgamesh wins. He has to win. He's the hero of the story and the king of Uruk. So he wins the fight. But then they kind of respect each other and they become BFFs and they go on all kinds of adventures together after that. Which brings me to the book of Genesis. And I know some of you are wondering, why would you tell the story of Gilgamesh? What does that have to do with 1968 or what happened this week or what's going on in the world right now? More than you think. Let's take a look at what it says in Genesis chapter 6. This is really important. The Bible says there were giants on the earth in those days. And also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them, those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Now, this might be one of the most misunderstood passages in the Bible and one of the most abused by modern Christianity because you'll hear some people read this and they'll say, you know what this is talking about? This is talking about fallen angels marrying human women and having children together, and those children were absolutely enormous, 10, 12 feet, 14 feet tall. That's not at all what the Bible's talking about. That might be what they say at 2 o'clock in the morning on talk radio, but that's not what the Bible is talking about. When the Bible mentions giants in this passage, the Hebrew word is nafil, nafil. It's where we get the word Nephilim, 
That's also been abused, that term, by the conspiracy theory crowd because some people think that the Nephilim are some kind of human fallen angel hybrid or maybe aliens who came and messed around with our DNA at one point or something, but that is not at all what the Bible's talking about. We know for a fact that angels and people can't get married and start families. They can't. Jesus made that clear in Matthew chapter 22. He said, angels do not marry. They do not reproduce. So this idea that you could have giant babies with a fallen angel is completely biblically ridiculous. It can't be true. What the passage is describing is illicit marriages between people who believe in God and people who do not, people who trust God, and people who live for themselves. Because according to the scriptures, when the human race got kicked out of the Garden of Eden, it essentially divided up into two camps. On the one hand, you had the sons of God, a line of people that even though they had sinned, they were fallen, they trusted God, and they knew God would send Messiah to save them, sons of God. Then you had Another group of people who rejected God altogether and decided to live for self. They wanted to be completely self-sufficient, and the Bible calls them the daughters of men. And what's happening in Genesis 6 is that the sons of God, the people of faith, they start to compromise their faith and marry unbelievers. And that never really works out very well. It's why the Bible tends to discourage it. Those marriages between believers and unbelievers led to a generation of very arrogant, self-important people. These aren't physical giants, not large in physical stature. They're giants of ego. That's what they are. The Hebrew word nafil, that's translated giants, it literally means, if you translate it literally, bully or tyrant. That's what the word literally means. These are arrogant, narcissistic people who are legends in their own minds. Some of them accumulated power and became brutal dictators like Gilgamesh did in later years. He comes after Genesis 6. These are people with a bottomless appetite for power. The same kinds of people who are still making our lives miserable to this day. And the Bible says that God had a rather low opinion of these people, Genesis 6, verse 4. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. You and I throw the word evil around rather lightly. If we don't like something, that's evil. If we don't like somebody's opinion, that's an evil opinion. We don't like food, that tastes evil. We throw the word around very lightly. But when God calls something evil, you know it's gone far too far. It continues, and the Lord was sorry that he'd made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping things and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. Imagine that kind of depravity. The human race at this point has become so self-congratulatory, so proud of its achievements, such a blight on the otherwise perfection and happiness of God's universe that God actually regrets creating us at this point. There is so much pain on earth, so much suffering, so much wickedness that this planet is no longer a showcase of God's goodness and love. In fact, the existence of the human race has now at this point become a lie about who the Creator is. Fallen angels can point to this world and say, look, that's what God made. Look at the way they behave. Our existence became a lie. And God was ready to wipe the slate clean, except you and I know there was one more chance, one itty-bitty tiny glimpse of hope that maybe Messiah could still come from a line of people who wanted him to come. God said, I am so sorry that I made these people, but then it says Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now we get a different kind of hero. This is a man that God holds out in startling contrast to the kinds of heroes described on these tablets, all these self-serving, arrogant kings that have been making people's lives absolutely miserable. Noah is different. Noah is a man who is truly great by God's estimate. And you'll notice that Noah's name was not lost in the rubble for thousands of years until some obscure archaeologist you've never heard of before tonight goes and digs it up and remembers him suddenly. God didn't let that happen. 
Noah is remembered by the entire human race. It doesn't matter where you go. And if his name isn't in a culture somewhere on earth, the story absolutely is. If you go travel the world and investigate the ancient records and listen to the stories of all the civilizations of the planet, you'll discover Noah's remembered absolutely everywhere. In fact, just the other day, I was reading through my copy of Josephus. Some of you will know that he was the famous Jewish historian who wrote for the Romans in the first century, roughly at the time of Christ and the early Christian church. And I was reading what he wrote, and I stumbled across this passage. He's writing this. Now, all the writers of barbarian histories... Let me pause there. The barbarians, those are my ancestors. They're tree-worshipping pagans living in northern Europe. And you know where the word barbarian comes from, right? The Greeks called everyone who wasn't Greek a barbarian. And, um, and, you know, the word barber is related to barbarian because all those people living in the woods up north were really, really hairy. And so barbers are named for barbarians. It's where the word comes from. And the reason they called us barbarians, the Greeks, is because they thought we were dumb. We were, but, you know, we, they, they especially thought that we were dumb and they made fun of our language. They said they don't even speak an intelligent language. It sounds like bar, 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 bar. And that's where we get the word barbarian. That's where it comes from. Those are my people. Now, all the writers of barbarian histories, my ancestors, make mention of this flood and of this ark, among whom is Barosus the Chaldeans. The Babylonians were telling the story. Hieronymus the Egyptian also, who wrote the Phoenician Antiquities. And Menasius, try and say that name five times fast, Menasius, and a great many more make mention of the same. Nay, Nicholas of Damascus in his 96th book. Imagine that. Imagine writing 96 books and nobody's ever heard of you, right? It's like, we don't even know. You never heard of him before tonight. You know, he wrote 96 books, probably more. That's got to be embarrassing. 96 books. I, I've written a few books. They're not good books. They're just books. And I found one one time for one cent on Amazon. One cent. Free would have been nicer. It would have looked like a mission project. One cent is a statement. Nay, Nicholas of Damascus in his 96 book speaks thus. Listen to this. There's a great mountain in Armenia over Minyas called Barus, upon which it is reported that many who fled at the time of the deluge were saved, and that one who was carried in an ark came on shore on the top of it, and that the remains of the timber were a great while preserved, so for a while they could still see the ark. This might be the man about whom Moses, the legislator of the Jews, wrote. It is. The story of Noah is one that everybody remembers. God has not allowed his memory to disappear, and that's intentional. In fact, a few years ago, I was raising money for a group of people that had been discovered living in a volcanic crater in Vanuatu. They've been cut off from the rest of the world for, we think, thousands of years, and I had a team going in to deliver supplies. And on the way through the jungle, their guide stopped and pointed to a big boulder in the trees and said, you know what that is? Ah, what is it? That's the anchor for Noah's Ark. Cut off from the rest of the world for like 2,000 years, and they're still telling the story. Now, it's not the anchor for Noah's Ark. It's in the wrong place. But the fact is, this oral tradition is still telling the story thousands of years later. And God has kept the memory of Noah alive because it's important. Noah's story took place in a time of evil of moral chaos, and the Bible ties Noah's story to another period of moral chaos at the very end of time. Jesus says, but as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be, a reference to the second coming. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. In other words, the moral chaos of Noah's day, with all those arrogant bullies running the show, the Bible says it happens again right before Jesus returns. So what does all of that have to do with the epic of Gilgamesh? Why am I telling that story? Well, you might want to buckle your seatbelts because I'm about to show you the reason the real reason that George Smith was running around in his underwear after he figured out what the tablet says. 
You already remember the story, you know it. The gods were concerned that Gilgamesh was too violent, he was too cruel, and they had to do something, so they create the monster in Kidu to keep him busy. But that didn't work because they became best friends and went on many adventures together. And there was one adventure that stands out from all the rest and reveals the secret identity of Gilgamesh, king of Uruk. I'm about to read from the tablets. If you want to look up and check on my work, it's tablet three, column three. That's where this comes from. The story says, in the forest dwells terrible Hawawa. Some translations say Humbaba, the Sumerian translations. The Akkadian, which are a Semitic language, says Hawawa. Let us, me and thee, kill him and let us destroy all the evil in the land. And Kidu answers. He opens his mouth and says to Gilgamesh, I learned it, my friend, when I was still ranging at large over the open country with the game. In other words, when he's living in the trees with the animals. To a distance of 10,000 double hours, the forest extends in each direction. That's 20,000 hours of travel. It's an eternal forest. That's where Huwawa lives. Who is it that would go down into its interior? Huwawa, his roaring is like that of a... Flood storm. A what? A flood storm. His mouth is like fire, his breath is death. I've met a few of those. So why dost thou desire to do this thing? An irresistible onslaught is the something of Huwawa. That part of the tablet is missing. We don't know what it says. Gilgamesh opened his mouth and said to Enkidu, The mountain of the cedar I will climb. Where do they have to go to find Huwawa? Into an eternal forest and up on a holy mountain. Follow the story very carefully. And Kidu opened his mouth and said to Gilgamesh, How shall we go to the cedar forest? Its guardian, Gilgamesh, is a warrior. He is strong and never does he sleep. Who else do we know that never sleeps? Psalm 121 says, Behold, he that keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. Now let's review the story we've discovered so far. In the Epic of Gilgamesh, they want to slaughter somebody named Huwawa who lives in an eternal forest up on a sacred mountain. He's described as a fiery presence. He's associated with destruction that came from a flood. And if you keep reading the tablets, you find out that Gilgamesh's ancestor is a man named Utnapishtim who is the only man who survived the flood in an ark. Now this story, we found it in the library of Ashurbanipal, it's obviously a myth, but there is some truth behind it all. There's a reminiscence of the true story in there. And more than one scholar has noticed a rather striking similarity between the name Hawawa and the name Yahweh, the God of Israel. Back in 1949, about a hundred years after the tablets were discovered, Alexander Heidel, of the University of Chicago read the tablets and came to a remarkable discovery. He said, you know what? The Gilgamesh in the tablets looks an awful lot like the Nimrod in the Bible. And Nimrod's great-grandfather is Noah. Gilgamesh is Nimrod. Now, when I was a kid, Nimrod appears in Genesis 10. When I was a kid, the principal of my elementary school I knew him very well because we still had the strap in those days. I knew the principal intimately. I knew him on a first name basis and he knew my name too. So I lived in terror of him most of the time. On the weekends, he was a hunter and a trapper. That's what he did. He had a trap line. I grew up in the middle of nowhere. He had a trap line and he was so proud of what he did out in the woods that he made a big wooden sign and hung it on his house. It said, home of Nimrod, the mighty hunter. Because when he read Genesis chapter 10, he thought it was a compliment, that God was complimenting Nimrod, and it is not a compliment at all. We're going to look at what the Bible actually says about this character, and it comes from a passage that Bible scholars call the Table of Nations, Genesis 10. Genesis 10 gives us a detailed account of Noah and his sons and all their descendants and where they settled after the flood. And it's one of those passages in the Bible that makes it really obvious that the book of Genesis is not a book of mythology because it's specific and businesslike and it names people in places that you can still find on the world map to this day. And at one point, it describes this mighty hunter named Nimrod. It says this, Genesis 10, verse 6. The sons of Ham, one of Noah's sons, were Cush, that's the old name for Ethiopia, Mizraim, that's the old name for Egypt, 
Put, that's the old name for Libya. Canaan, we all know where that one is. That becomes the land of Israel in time. And Cush begot Nimrod, and he began to be a mighty one on the earth. He's a giant, just like Gilgamesh. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it is said, like Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. Again, it's not a compliment. We think historically Nimrod's not hunting animals. He's hunting human beings. This is describing an arrogant, violent, self-absorbed man who refuses to worship the God of heaven. He's mighty before the Lord in the sense that he defies God, shakes his fist at heaven, and dares God to do something about it. In fact, we're pretty sure the name Nimrod isn't a name at all. We think that the Jews refused to say the name Gilgamesh out loud. They just used the word Nimrod because Nimrod means the rebel. And he was too evil to say his name. So they just called him the rebel and everybody knew who they were talking about. If you go back and dig around in the ancient records of other civilizations, you'll find all these writings that tell us that Gilgamesh and Nimrod built the Tower of Babel. Now, we don't know that's true. The Bible doesn't say that it is. But we do remember the Tower of Babel and the city of Babel as the ultimate act of defiance against the God of heaven. And the Bible does tell us that Nimrod was a city builder. He loved to create these big fortified communities that made him feel safe and secure. And one of the leading of those communities was Babel, the first urban centers, the very first cities. And what were they? artificial paradise. We'd been kicked out of Eden, and now we needed a place where life was more convenient. We didn't want to work by the sweat of our brow, so we built cities to make things easier. Here's what the Bible says in Genesis 10, verse 10. And the beginning of his, this is Nimrod, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. Of course, Babel shows up as Babylon the Great in prophecy in the book of Revelation. It's the ultimate enemy of God's people. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Erech, Wait a minute, what city was Gilgamesh the king of? Uruk. It's where we get the name for the country Iraq. Babel, Erech, Akkad, and Kalna in the land of Shinar. The reason the Sumerians are called the Sumerians is Sumer is a cognate word for uh, for Shinar. It's the same place. From that land, he, Nimrod, went to Assyria and built Nineveh, the very place that we found all the tablets. What this is describing is the birth of big urban centers, places where people can become so comfortable they don't feel like they need to rely on God anymore. They're artificial paradise. And throughout the rest of the Bible, you find these man-made, Nimrod-style kingdoms called the nations. Goyim in Hebrew, Gentiles. And the nations in the Bible is not a compliment. I'll give you an example. Psalm 2. Why do the nations, Goyim, rage, and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. It's what Nimrod was doing, saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. Nobody tells us what to do. So in other words, these nations, these city-states that Nimrod designed were deliberately created for life without God. They were homes for self-sufficient, self-serving people. But of course, the problem with that arrangement is that when you put a bunch of selfish people together in a city, somebody will accumulate power and they will rise to the top. And when you rise to the top, you tend to abuse the people who live downstream from you. The most powerful man or woman in a town almost always becomes a little bit of a tyrant like Nimrod or Gilgamesh. And we've been living with this mess ever since. This story in Genesis 10 is ground zero for every upheaval that has happened since then. Every single one. We are still living with the fallout. In this story, in Genesis 10, we find explanations for what happened in 1968 and what happened in 1914 and what happened in 1939 and what happened this past week and is going on right now. The never-ending chaos is the direct result of our human rejection of God's government and our decision to go it alone. And in the book of Genesis, when things got really, really bad, God destroys that Tower of Babel, and he looks through that entire region of Chaldea and finds one man who will trust him. The next Noah. His name is Abraham. 
He comes from Chaldea, the neighborhood of Nimrod. In fact, if you read some of the ancient records, not the Bible, so it might not be true, but some of the ancient records say that Abraham probably met Nimrod at one point. And just like Noah, everybody remembers the name of Abraham because half the people on planet Earth alive tonight lay claim to Abraham as their spiritual father. 2.3 billion Christians, 1.8 billion Muslims and all of the Jews, that's four billion plus people lay claim to Abraham. His name is alive to this day. He's remembered for leaving the Nimrod-style governments and restoring the knowledge of the one true creator, God. So what God does is take Abraham out of Nimrod's neighborhood, moves him out west to the land of Canaan, which is to become the land of Israel. And God does that so that he can establish his own nation with his own people at the very crossroads of the ancient world. You had to go through there. If you went from Asia to Europe or Africa to Europe or Europe to Africa, you went through there and the people set up the temple so that they could display the love of God and help everybody break free from all those horrible forms of government that are always, always in a state of upheaval. And then when the time was right, Messiah would come to redeem us, pay the penalty of our sins so we could be forgiven and step back into our original form of paradise. God gave these people the temple, the sacrificial system, its rituals, all designed to reveal the work of Messiah when he came. That temple in Jerusalem became the talk of the ancient world, and everything was going well. It was doing the job that God intended until one day the people of God looked over the fence at all the Nimrod-style nations and thought, you know, they have a lot of convenience. Pretty glamorous out there. Look at all the power they have. And they thought, that's what we want. And they made the biggest mistake in human history, the day that Israel asked for a king. They're literally asking if they can have Gilgamesh back, please. It's a story that happens in 1 Samuel chapter 8. Samuel's getting old, he's about to die, and the Israelites are panicking. What are we going to do about leadership? So they call an important meeting. Samuel, we've been thinking. You know, we love you, but you're getting old and you're going to go soon. And we're thinking, we've grown up a lot as a people, and we're not Egyptian slaves anymore, and we're free and respectable. We've got culture, we've got industry, we've got college degrees, we're going to get an in and out burger in Rama. I mean, everything's coming right here. And we're thinking maybe it's time to grow up and become a real nation. What do you mean a real nation? That's not what you're supposed to be. You're supposed to stand in contrast. God's using you to show what could be. Oh, Samuel, you don't get it. You're just old. You're not with the times. I mean, we, we understand you're not keeping up. You should probably have a Twitter account so that you can keep up with what's going on. But look around you. Every other country, without exception, has a professional at the top running the whole show. And we're embarrassed because we look like a bunch of peasants. We want a king. The Bible says the thing displeased Samuel. When they said, give us a king to judge us, so Samuel prayed to the Lord. He got a very surprising answer. The Lord said to Samuel, heed the voice of the people in all that they say to you. They have not rejected you, but they've rejected me that I should not reign over them. It's a repeat of what we did in the Garden of Eden. They're asking for Nimrod-style government. And God's about to let them have it because God doesn't force anybody to follow him. He doesn't force anything. So he's going to let them have it, but he doesn't let them have it without a warning. He describes what their life's going to be like. Watch this. This will be the behavior of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for his chariots. That king's going to make you work for him, verse 12. He will appoint captains over his thousands and captains over his fifties. You will always be at war after this and there's going to be conscription. He will take the best of your fields, your vineyards, and your olive groves and give them to his servants and you will be his servants. You will be taxed beyond reason, and you will never be free again. But apparently, this is what you want. I'm going to let you have it. What a disaster. It was the upheaval that changed everything after that. God's special nation gets compromised, and that's a disaster that continues to this day. Our world is a mess right now because we have never quite escaped the gravitational pull of that one horrible decision. And that one horrible decision paved the way for something the Bible calls the abomination of desolation. And if you've been studying prophecy, you know the abomination of desolation is a massive theme in prophetic books like Daniel and Revelation. 
Those kings of Israel got worse and worse and worse. They behaved more and more like Nimrod until their behavior is completely out of control. You know that the Hebrew Bible doesn't end with the book of Malachi. That's our Old Testament. We rearrange the books a little bit to suit our Western tastes. The Bible hasn't been corrupted. The Hebrews have exactly the same Bible, but theirs ends with 2 Chronicles chapter 36. It's the final chapter. And in that chapter, it tells us that King Jehoiakim did evil in the sight of the Lord and committed abominations. That's an important word. Then it says Jehoiakim did the same thing, did evil in the sight of the Lord. Then it says Zedekiah did evil in the sight of the Lord, and it got so bad they started to perform human sacrifice, offering their own babies to a white-hot steel idol named Molech. Burn them alive. Because Nimrod-style government always ends in disaster because we're in charge. And at that point, God can't take it anymore. He puts a stop to it. And how does he put a stop to it? He sends Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king, the current occupant of Nimrod's throne, ironically enough, to come and burn down the temple, and the temple is left desolate. God allows it because there's no point to the temple anymore. They're just going through the motions. They don't love God, and they want it to live like Nimrod, and so God sends them to go live with Nimrod. Go ahead and go live over there. When the Bible talks about the abomination of desolation, it is not talking about some outsider, some dictator that shows up in Europe. I know that's fashionable now. It's not at all. When the Bible talks about the abomination of desolation, it's talking about the abominations of God's own people that lead to desolation. It's us. After he destroys the city, Nebuchadnezzar rounds up the brightest and the best in Jerusalem, and he hauls them all back to Babylon, which might be the most embarrassing part of the story, because once upon a time, Abraham traveled west to go to Canaan, and he was supposed to establish a nation where Messiah could appear. The nation of Israel was supposed to be the bride of Christ. It was, and we say that of the church, but it's also true of Israel. If you read Ezekiel 16, that becomes obvious. Israel was the bride of Christ. But now, because the bride is unfaithful, because she cheated on her husband and wanted Nimrod more, she has to go back home. That's what happens. It's the longest walk of shame in the history of the world. The temple is gone, and the bride is sent back home to where dad came from, because that's what they said they wanted. And it's at this point in history that one of the Bible's most important prophetic books suddenly emerges in the presence of God's people. The book of Daniel. It is the key to understanding the book of Revelation. It shows up in the midst of their captivity. Why? Because God, at this point, has not given up on His plan to bring Messiah and save the world. He has not yet given up on His plan to redeem humanity and restore us to paradise, even though we have rejected Him over and over and over and over. Suddenly in Babylon, Daniel chapter 2, the king Nebuchadnezzar has a disturbing dream. And because it's so disturbing, he thinks he just got a message from the gods. We know how important dreams were to those ancient civilizations because of the tablets that we found around the city of Nineveh. Among the tablets, we found Ashurbanipal's dream interpretation tablets. And we made a remarkable discovery. The dream interpretation books that you buy in the store today, all that New Age nonsense, that stuff, we thought it was written in the first century by a guy by the name of Artemidorus. It turns out Artemidorus had stolen it all from the library of Ashurbanipal. It's the same content as on those tablets. The ancients took dreams very seriously. And this dream so disturbing, he calls for his counselors in the middle of the night. Who? The Chaldeans. Chaldea is not just a region. In 600 BC, it's a special class of people. They hold the keys of knowledge in Babylon. They're the philosophers, the scientists, the astronomers, the astrologers. That's still with us to this day. Mathematicians. Babylonian math is still with us to this day. They used base 60. We don't use base 60, Sean. We use base 10. No, we use base 60. There's 60 seconds in a minute and 60 minutes in an hour and 360 degrees in a circle. That comes from the Chaldeans. They did that. They were the priests of the empire, the religious and intellectual authorities of the day. In Persia, they would have called them the Magi, as in the people who came to see the infant Christ. In Babylon, they're the Chaldeans. 
and they're talented. They said they knew how to divine the will of the gods. So if you had a disturbing dream, you'd call for them too if you could. And the Bible tells us what happened. So they came and stood before the king, and the king said to them, I have had a dream, and my spirit is anxious to know the dream. Then the Chaldean spoke to the king in Aramaic, Oh, king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will give the interpretation. Oh, that's it. It's just a dream. He woke us up at two in the morning. We thought maybe the Assyrians were invading again, and war in the middle of the night is bad. Sir, if it's just a dream, we know how to handle dreams. You tell us what you dreamt. We will go down to the library and we will get the dream interpretation tablets and we will tell you what it means. Except on this night, that dream was so disturbing that Nebuchadnezzar doesn't trust them. Something tells him, maybe I can't believe these people anymore. What if they're liars? You ever get that feeling somebody's been lying to you your whole life? You can't have bad intelligence. So he puts these guys to the test. He says, the king answered and said to the Chaldeans, my decision is firm. If you do not make known the dream to me and its interpretation, you will be cut in pieces and your houses will be made an ash heap. If you can't get inside my head, gentlemen, I'm going to chop you in little bitty pieces and cut off your family line. That was the worst fate imaginable in the ancient world, having your family line cut off. Have you ever gone to your boss and said, I don't think my work is challenging me quite enough? I mean, we do that now in the 21st century. You didn't do that as a Chaldean. Guy, sir, just tell us what the dream means. No, I'm not going to do you. I'm not going to tell you what you, I dreamt. You say you talk to the gods, and I think the gods gave me that dream. You go ask them for the dream. Then I'll know if I can trust you. If you can't do that, I'm chopping you in pieces. However, if you tell the dream and its interpretation, you will receive from me gifts, rewards, and great honor. Therefore, tell me the dream and its interpretation. What are they going to do? You can't get inside the human head. We still can't do it. I understand you can read facial expressions, figure some stuff out. My wife can read me like a book. You can put someone in a functional MRI and you see which part of their brain lights up, right? There's a reason we torture people in warfare. It's because it's impossible to read the human mind. When the first temple was dedicated by Solomon, the one that Nebuchadnezzar destroyed, in his prayer in 1, Samuel 8, 1 Kings chapter 8, he says, Thou alone, O Lord, know the hearts of men. Only God can read the heart and the mind. And these guys know that. So they panic. What are we going to do? Let's go reason with him. They answered again and said, let the king tell his servants the dream and we will give its interpretation. Come on, sir. Come on, sir. Nebuchadnezzar, you know how this is supposed to work. You wrote the employee handbook and the employee handbook says, you tell the dreams, we go to the library. Don't make us go to the union. Don't make us do it. So they wouldn't have done that to Nebuchadnezzar. The king answered and said, I know for certain you're trying to gain time. You boys are stalling because you see that the word for me is firm. If you do not make the dream known to me, there is but one sentence for you. You have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the time has changed. Therefore, tell the dream and I will know that you can give me the interpretation. Here's a major theme in Bible prophecy. You can live a lie. You might fool your family and your friends your whole life. But it's only a matter of time until all of us get pushed out in the bright sunlight and everybody can see what we're really made out of. And all the bullies running the world today and making all the trouble and all the upheavals, they get pushed out in the bright sunlight eventually too. Everybody's life gets put to the test. It's one of the biggest themes in Bible prophecy. And for these guys, their number is up. They've been exposed. They can't do it. They can't get inside the king's head and read his mind. So the king blows a gasket. He is mad. He trusted these guys. That's it. Go get them all and murder them all. Go get the wood chipper. It's time for the retirement. That's it. I'm done. So a guy by the name of Ariok goes through the kingdom, knocking on doors, waking up the rest of the wise men to bring them to the early retirement party. And in the process, as he goes out there, he knocks on the door of a young man named Daniel. And Daniel is not a Babylonian. Mm -mm. He's Hebrew. He's a member of the royal family. He was taken captive in the siege on Jerusalem, and when they brought him back, they put him in a special retraining program, basically the University of Babylon. They immersed him in Babylonian culture. They gave him a new name. Daniel means God is my judge. They gave him the name Belteshazzar, which is in honor of the Babylonian god 
Bel. They taught him in Babylonian schools. They taught him to think like a Babylonian, live like a Babylonian, eat like a Babylonian, hoping that he would become Babylonian, and then all his people would follow suit, follow his example, and they'd be happy in Babylon and never stage an uprising. Daniel, however, at age 17 or so, is so bright, he rises to the top of the class, and he's considered smarter than the rest, and now the king just thinks of him as one of the Chaldeans. That's just what he is. Daniel, we got to go. What is it, Ariok? What's going on? It's 2.30 in the morning. I can't go anywhere. I'm in my pajamas. No, no. You, we got to go right now. King says, you got to go. Well, why? Well, unfortunately, I have to cut you in pieces tonight, and we got to go. It's like, well, why are you going to cut me in pieces tonight? That, that doesn't sound nice at all. I'd rather be in bed. It's like, no, no. It's bad. Well, why is it so bad? Well, the king had a dream. Well, so what? Well, he wants to know what it means. Well, send those guys down to the library to get the tablets, because that's what they always do, those bunch of liars. They'll just lie to him, and we can all get some sleep again. Well, that's the problem. He won't tell them the dream. He says the gods gave it to him, and, and they have to ask the gods what the dream... All of a sudden, Daniel knows what's going on. Oh, this is different. This is different. Somebody's intervening in the kingdom of Nimrod right now. Take me to see the king. And for some reason, when he asks for extra time, the king trusts it. The Chaldean stalled it made him mad. But for some reason, he trusts Daniel because character matters. Character matters matters. People remember it. So he gathers his three friends. You remember them from when you were a kid. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And what do they do that night? They do not go get more tablets. They do not consult the ancient star charts. They do not read tea leaves. They do not cut open a goat and dump its entrails on the ground and try to discern the future. They don't have a seance. They just do what our grandparents used to do. Pray. And that's the most important thing you could be doing right now when the world's in upheaval. Pray. And in the quiet hours of the night, God showed them the dream. He revealed the cause of every upheaval. It's a story that would blow your mind if I had time to tell it, change your life. I just don't have time to tell it. You would have to read the new lessons. But I will tell you this. What happens next is the reason I know that God is real. The book of Daniel predicts the entire future of the entire planet in mind-boggling detail, including the upheavals we're living with right now. And it's never been wrong, not even once, in 2,600 years. And it explains everything that's going on. It even predicted the modern nations of Europe, the kingdoms that you still find on the map to this day, which means something important. It means that no upheaval, no chaos has ever caught God by surprise. Not 1968, not now, not ever. And God tells us, hang in there. I know what's coming next. The dream was a statue. That's what Nebuchadnezzar saw, made of different metals. Head of gold, chest and arms of silver, belly and thighs of brass or bronze, depending on the English translation. Legs of iron, feet of iron and clay. And it turns out that all these metals are predicting the future empires, the Nimrod-style governments of the world. All of them. And here's what God is telling His people. These metals represent Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome, Modern day, God says, look, you wanted what those kingdoms have? All right, here's the deal. From here on out, we're going down to Kingdom Mart, and you're going to try on the entire Nimrod collection. You're going to try on every outfit that Nimrod's ever made. Let's try them all on. Put on Babylon. How does that fit, folks? Well, not too good. We don't really like it here. Okay, then let's put on a Persian outfit. How does that? Well, that he was, Cyrus was nice. He let us go home, but this doesn't fit too well either. Well, how about Alexander the Great? Well, that one doesn't fit too well. He, he, one of his generals later on came and sacrificed a pig in our temple. That wasn't very nice. Okay, well, let's try on Rome. Rome, they crucified 2,000 Jews in one day on one occasion. That didn't fit well. How about Europe? Nothing? Nothing from the closet of Nimrod fits? You ever wonder why this world doesn't feel like home? Why it's so uncomfortable? Maybe God's letting us try everything on so we know He was right. I have one more option, God says. And the one more option is the only part in Daniel 2 that hasn't actually happened yet. And it's supposed to happen right about now. Right about now. If you want to know what it is, you have to read the lessons. 
Daniel 7. It's another prophecy. This is the very picture of upheaval. Back in Daniel's day, the Jews considered themselves to be an island of God's covenant people living in a Gentile sea. That was the common understanding, and they really were. They had Nimrod-style governments living all around them. And those governments, those Gentile kingdoms, were always at war with each other, which is why in Daniel 7, you see the wind whipping up the sea. It's a symbol of war, one kingdom after another. Four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. It's the same kingdoms you find in Daniel chapter 2. Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome, the remnants of the Roman Empire. And then an astonishing and very disturbing development in the world of religion, and then it shows us right now. And then it says at some point in Revelation 13, which is encouraging us to read Daniel 7, that all the world wonders after the beast. Nothing happening right now has caught God by surprise. He saw it coming, and you can know it's coming too. Daniel gives us the history of the world from his day, 600 years before Christ, to right now, to this moment when the winds of chaos are blowing stronger than ever and the upheaval feels like it's never going to stop. 2,000 years ago, one day the Bible tells us Jesus and the disciples are walking through Jerusalem and, and the disciples stop. They see that rebuilt temple that they rebuilt after they came home from Babylonian captivity. And it's one of the wonders of the ancient world. After Herod the Great finished working on it, it was the biggest single meeting place on the entire planet. And the disciples looked at that and they thought, wow, that's amazing. Look at this, Jesus. Proof that we can't get it wrong again. Proof that God will always be with us. We might have been in captivity once, but look at that temple that can't go south again. And Jesus stops. And he makes another prediction about the temple. And in the process, he reveals the upheaval we're living with right now. Do you not see all these things, Jesus said? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. And today, we know that Jesus was absolutely right. Forty years after he said that, the Romans came to town and ripped the temple apart. Not one stone was left upon another. They knew after they lit it on fire that the gold had melted into the cracks of the temple and it made the Romans mad, so they pulled it all apart and it's still in pieces. All the stones are still lying where they left them to this day near the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem. It was the second abomination of desolation. And at that point, Jesus encouraged everybody, you should be studying Daniel. He said, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. And then he connects what happened there to the very end of time. And he says, you will hear wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not troubled for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilence, and earthquakes in various places. Why? God has allowed the Nimrod-style governments of this world to run their course, and they're designed to fail, and they fall apart, and we are now reaping the consequences of self-government for thousands of years. That's what's going on right now. There's a reason our world feels like it's fallen apart, and there's a reason that it appears to be getting worse. And according to the Bible, all these kingdoms come and go after we've done our best to run this world ourselves, then the judgment sits. I beheld, Daniel says, till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were opened. Everything in the book of Daniel that was predicted has already happened. Almost all of it. What are the odds that this one is also true? And what if this is already happening right now? At the end of this judgment, it would be important to know this. At the end of this judgment, God takes the world back. 
I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him, this is Jesus, dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people's nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. That is the last upheaval, the very last one. And I know, We live in scary times. It's hard to know exactly how bad it's going to get. But I do know what happens next. You can know it too. God's going to push the reset button. And he's going to bring us back where we once were. And this is God's promise for the future. I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain. For the former things have passed away. If you're sick and tired of the way we run the planet, There's one more upheaval coming. And I think you're going to love it. A lot of people are scared to study Bible prophecy. They really are. Because they think it's the story of God hating people. But can't wait to destroy us. Think about that. If you hated the human race, why would you pay for them with your life? God's not a bad investor. He's not going to lose his investment. Bible prophecy is the story of God turning over every one of our upheavals forever. It's the most hopeful thing I've ever read. To the point where I'm not at all worried about what happens next. I go to bed, I see the news like you do. And because I know what the book says, I'm doing pretty well. God puts an end to it. Father in heaven, this evening, we've taken a moment to look at your word. Drive us there. Let us see your love for us. Give us the hope that you offer that what's going on in the world isn't going to go forever and that you've got a plan to reverse it. Tonight we put our hearts in your hands and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.